So you want to get a PhD, huh? Well, if you're like me, maybe you sat in a psychology 101 class, maybe in high school or in college, and you thought to yourself, you know, maybe I want to be a therapist or a researcher or any one of those jobs that requires getting a PhD. And if so, same. Since I've shared the critically acclaimed Psychology 101 lecture series, adequately named Teach Us Dr. Hirsch here on YouTube, I've noticed that a lot of the comments and responses have come from students that are either currently in a college class and looking for clarification, or they're in high school and they're trying to figure out if maybe psychology is something that they might want to major in. But I did forget to include one lecture in that package, and so I'm recording it now. Ordinarily, I would save this one for the last day of class, but for people that are interested in applying to PhD programs, it might end up actually being the most important lesson that you're going to get here. You see, there are a lot of tips and tricks to the process of applying to a PhD program, and no one told me any of them until I had already fallen on my face at least once. And hopefully I can get you on the right track here and save you at least some time, maybe some headaches, possibly some heartaches, but definitely a lot of money so you don't get caught sleeping like I did. Before any of that though, just a quick refresher on who I am and why I'm qualified to talk about any of this. In addition to being a glamorous internet idol beloved by millions, I am a social psychologist by training and a quantitative psychologist in practice. I'm coming at this from my own experience of applying to social psychology PhD programs and also having helped review the application packages of other prospective students. Your mileage may differ though, so make sure to double check any of this information and try to tease out what does and doesn't apply to you. But this should be a good jumping off point whether you're interested in social psych, developmental psych, or maybe just any broad pattern PhD program. Typically applications look very similar. All right, everybody good? All right, hands and feet inside the, the ride at the whole time. I mean, what, what, that, that, that's lame, that's lame. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's get started. All right, what I got here are the four key parts of the typical application package listed in ascending order of importance. So grade point average, your score on the graduate records exam, letters of recommendation, and your personal statement. These are the four real key things we're gonna cover here. The first two I'm gonna group together because they're actually used very similarly. But we're going to get into more detail on the third and fourth point, your letters of rack and your personal statement, because not only are they the most important, but they are also the most ambiguous and the things that you should probably be spending the most time on. So moving into the actual content here, your grade point average. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this because most of you probably know what a GPA is. And well, it basically boils down to a higher score is better. And I know, wow, whoa, this is the kind of incredible insight that you've come here to like, comment, and subscribe for. You see, the long and short of it is that your GPA doesn't actually matter all that much beyond a certain point when you're applying. Now, let me explain here for a second, because you're probably thinking, well, why am I busting my ass in all of my classes if my GPA doesn't matter? Well, it kind of does. You see, the thing is, once you get into the pool of applicants for a PhD program, it turns out that basically everyone is a gigantic nerd. Maybe like you, but definitely like me, who did really well in all of their classes and probably has a very high GPA. And if the range of people that you're looking at is like 3.6 to 4.0, it doesn't do a lot. There's a very restricted range, and so you can't really differentiate between applicants using GPA. So how does it actually get used? Well, it's typically a cutoff. It might be the mean of the pool of applicants in a given year, or it might be a hard cutoff for a given program. Typically, the range of EPAs of admitted students is publicly available. So make sure that you actually look this up to make sure that you're in the right ballpark for the programs that you're applying for. Now, beyond a broad GPA, Individual classes might factor in, and this is gonna come into your transcript, but again, it's probably not as much as you would think. It's more of a cutoff. So for example, let's say uh, you're an overworked developmental psychology professor, and you're looking at an application and you're scrolling through their grades in specific classes, and you see that this person got a D in developmental psych or didn't even take developmental psych. 
that may raise your eyebrows a little bit, and you might want to put that application to the side and then never look at it again and move on to the other 199 applications that you have to go through on this cycle. So this is typically how your GPA is going to end up being used. So try to figure out if you're within the certain ballpark of what a program is looking for, but getting very far beyond that isn't going to help you that much. Now, slightly, and I do mean slightly more important than your GPA is your score on the GRE or the graduate records exam. If you survive the ACT or the SAT in high school, this is basically a grown up version of those. It is a little bit more interesting. It is actually an adaptive test. And so the questions get harder or easier as you get questions right or wrong. And there are two versions of the GRE. There is the general, which most programs are going to ask you to do. And then there is the subject test. The subject test is not typically asked for even when I was applying um, <clears throat> um, a number of years ago. I noticed that a lot of programs had actually scaled back on how heavily they were weighting this. And there's a good reason for that. The general covers math and language, and there's a writing sample as well, just like the ACT and SAT. It's very broad skills. The subject test is kind of a weird one. It's split into different sub areas of psychology. So I signed up and I went, showed up to the test and I'm applying for, again, social programs. And then the bulk of the actual test has nothing to do with social psychology. It had a lot of questions about developmental psychology, about clinical psychology, counseling psychology, things that I didn't really study and I didn't really need to know which means that my specific subscore on the social psychology subject of the subject test was really only based on maybe 10 or 15 questions, which is a very small pool and one or two wrong quest answers could actually really skew my score. Because of that, a lot of programs don't really ask for this anymore. But again, take a look at it and make sure that you're in the right ballpark because you don't want to send out your application package and spend all the money on that and spend the money to send your GRE scores to a program and then find out that they require the psychology subject test and you're out of the running immediately. So save yourself some money. Make sure you read up on what you actually need to take. Don't take the subject test if you don't need to. And you can take the GRE multiple times. You can take it up to five times in one year. And importantly, there is zero shame in doing so. I know many doctors that took the GRE multiple times before they were happy with their scores. I am one of them. I took it twice, but it does cost money to take and retake that test. So again, save yourself some money, download the apps, get the flashcards, buy the books, do what have you. Take it as few times as you need to. I, for one, I found the flashcards really useful. I had them, you know, I made them myself. And then as I was commuting to and from my job on the train, I would just do flashcards for the math problems and formulas and vocabulary. And that was probably the most effective studying that I did. So highly recommend on stuff like that. So you don't really need to spend the money. You can probably find free resources even at this point. But like GPA, it's typically going to just be used as a cutoff. Again, most people tend to do pretty well. So again, look up what your programs are looking for in GRE scores and aim for that. You don't need to put too much pressure on yourself for this. You do not need to get a perfect score. Yes, more is better, but getting so much higher than that threshold actually isn't going to help you that much. So get the study guides, grind out what you need to know and take it as few times as you need to spend as little time and little money on this as you can. Now, here's a fun question. What do you think the GRE actually predicts? Does it predict teaching evaluations? Does it predict the number of publications a person gets? Does it predict their grad school GPA? Does it predict job placement? Or maybe predicts all of the above? Just think about this one for a second, huh? Let me, let me pause the video because I'm going to drop this in three, two, one. It predicts nothing, absolutely nothing that is relevant to, or well, I guess what we would consider to be a meaningful outcome in grad school. You want to know what it does predict, what it is correlated with? Your score is on the ACT and the SAT. That's kind of it. 
Like my scores on the ACT were pretty mid. My scores on the GRE also pretty mid, but you're still listening to me here, right? Because I was in grad school once I got over the hoop, like once I jumped through the hoop and got there, I had excellent teaching evaluations, better than many of our tenured faculty. I published like a demon, did very well in all my classes, and I've been a rising star in every job that I've had since I graduated. So <laughs> unfortunately, the GRE is very stressful. The GRE can take a lot of time and maybe you'll have to take it multiple times. And you're probably wondering, why? Why do I have to do this? Well, the, the tough love answer is that this is not going to be the last time that you're going to have to jump through hoops as a PhD student. So play the game, jump through the hoop, get the score you need to get and get out. It's just another step that we all have to go through. So get it done as quickly and as easily as you can. Now, I group GPA and GRE scores together here because they are hard metrics. You can look at two different scores, put them next to each other, and you can say that one is higher or lower than the other. Graduate programs typically have a lot of applicants and very few open positions. For a number of reasons, a lot of it comes down to funding. In the year that I was accepted into the program that I ultimately went to, there were over 200 applicants for all of two slots. So if you're an already stressed professor with committee appointments, existing papers, your own classes, and students that are, are pinging you for an email you haven't responded to in two weeks, you've got to somehow narrow that list down. And you know, even of that 200, odds are most of them are qualified and most of them could probably do very well in your program. You got to use something to narrow the field so GPA and GRE end up fitting the bill better than the other measures here, like your letters of recommendation and your personal statement. It's kind of actually how I imagine those big like content VTuber agencies probably use stuff like viewership and subscribers. You've got to narrow the field somehow. So if you're below a certain threshold of subs or average viewership, you just they don't even look at your reel. So you heard it here, folks. Being a grad student is exactly like being an idol, and that would actually probably make a fun video at some point. But before I get too deep into the well of despair of what I just said, uh, let's let's move on. Okay, let's let's move up the ladder of importance. Letters, letters of recommendation. From this point on, we're getting into fuzzy territory. There's a lot of intangible factors that come into play here. Personally, I've never seen a program ask for less than three, but some I've seen ask for four. So think about this and make sure that you're picking people that are going to write you good letters. These do end up mattering quite a bit. So who do you actually ask? Well, you want to make sure you're right asking people that are going to write you strong letters of recommendation. And it is OK to ask them that and say, hey, Dr. So-and-so. I am applying to XYZ programs, and I'm wondering, would you be willing to write me a strong letter of recommendation? If a student came up to me and said that, and I didn't think I'd be able to make a good case for them, I would tell them that. And I have done that. I've had students come up to me and say, hey, Dr. Super Cool Awesome Dr. Hirsch. That's my, my full title, if you, if you spell everything out. Would you be willing to write me a letter of recommendation? And I tell them, well, yes, is the short answer. The long answer is yes, but I only had you in Psych 101 and that was two years ago or three years ago. And I don't really know if I have a lot of stuff that I can really write about. So I'm happy to be a third or a fourth letter writer, but make sure you you have some people that know you better that are also writing letters for you and only comes to me if you really need that extra one. I think if you say anything else but that to a student in that position, you're kind of a jerk. So who do you ask? Well, you're probably thinking, I'm going to go to my instructors, particularly I got an A in, let's let's say, counseling psych. So I'm going to get a letter from my counseling psych professor because I'm applying to counseling psych programs. That's not a bad idea. It's very intuitive. But consider that you are maybe one of 40 to 100 different students in that class. How well does that professor really know you? No one told me that, but the reality is that instructors can only really write about the things they know. 
And so when you go to the people who just had you in a class, what else can they really say? But, well, she showed up and she sat in the front row like a nerd and she asked a bunch of questions like a nerd and did well on classes. So I, I guess that she's fine. Some of the strongest red letters of recommendation are not going to come from your course instructors. They will probably come from research supervisors. I cannot stress enough how important it is to get involved in research and to volunteer or even get a job as a research assistant when you're an undergrad. This gets you FaceTime with a professor as well as their graduate students, while you're also building up the kinds of skills that your potential advisor in graduate school is going to want to see. So when you're running participants and entering data and maybe helping out with papers, maybe doing your own posters, you're giving those graduate students and the professor that you're working along with stuff that they can write about. They can write a dense and very positive letter for you, a strong letter, if you will, because they have a lot to write about. And I really, really cannot stress enough how important that experience that you get as a research assistant is, especially because no one told me until my last year of undergrad. All right. So we've talked about research supervisors and graduate students as well. They can also write letters. The, the truth here is that actually as a graduate student, sometimes you work more closely with the research assistants than the actual professor. And in those cases, you might end up actually writing a large portion of the letter and then your supervisor just kind of signs off on it. As much as this is a very big factor, it's kind of informal sometimes. And there's a lot of wishy-washy intangibles that go into it. Like, who does the letter writer actually know? This is, again, an OK thing that you can write about. Once you've narrowed down your list of programs you're applying to and you know what professors you're going to apply to, go ahead and then ask your letter writers, maybe send them your spreadsheet or something and say, do you know any of these professors? Because research is actually a very, very small world. And generally, the people that work in similar areas of research also attend the same conferences, and they might even be friends that have gotten up to some hijinks after said conferences. In a letter from a colleague, a friend, or even a good friend that you shared one too many beers at at a poster session might actually hit a little bit harder than a letter from someone that you don't actually know. It's not just a letter of recommendation. It's a letter of personal recommendation from someone that maybe your prospective advisor knows and trusts. All in all, your letters of recommendation are there to give other people a chance to talk about you, but your personal statement is your chance, really your only chance, to talk about yourself in your own words. Drafted several times, get as much feedback as possible because you want this to be a slam dunk. In fact, you need this to be a slam dunk. It is the single most important thing in your application package for a couple of reasons. Well, let's see, What's, where do I start with this one? Being a PhD student is more than just being a student. You're not a consumer of knowledge. You are a producer of knowledge. It is a job. So take a second and turn the table around and think about this from the perspective of your potential advisor. They are trying to make a decision about a employee that is more than just a student. For the next several years, you're going to work closely with whoever you accept, and their performance is going to reflect back on you. When my advisor, for example, went up for tenure, my actual awards and papers were factored into her application. Really, our careers, even now that I'm no longer in academia, are still linked. And even after you finish your degree, you might even just stay in contact, even on a friendly level. This is where that nebulous term fit comes in, because apart from work, this also gives that potential advisor a chance to check your vibes and see what you might be like and whether you might actually mesh interpersonally. And this is where those intangibles come in. You don't really know how all this is going to fit together. You're kind of putting yourself out there, probably not knowing a lot about the potential advisor. So you're trying to cold read each other to see if you're going to get through to the next round of, uh, of the applicant consideration process. So this matters a lot, but it's also one of the things that I guess in some ways you have the most control over and in some ways the least. And we'll talk about that in another minute. 
before we get into that, let's get back to the actual meat and bones of the personal statement. When you're writing about this, you want to consider things that are unique to you. Uh, if you were a research assistant, did you do any posters? Maybe you helped write a paper. Maybe you worked on some analyses or something like that. That is something that is only excellent to write about. It's unique to you. And you should also try to make the case for why you want to work with this particular professor because they want to hear that. They want to know why does this person want to work with me? Maybe you read one of their papers or a chapter they wrote in one of your classes, or maybe you heard very good things about them from the research supervisor or a graduate student or somebody like that, and you want to have a chance to work with them. This is the kind of stuff that you want to make sure you include in your letter. Yes, it's cool to talk about your classwork, but you know, I applied to social psych programs and I thought, you know, I'm just gonna tell them that I did great in social psychology. Unbeknownst to me, so did everybody else that applied. So it wasn't really worth focusing on. Um, yeah, really try to get as much feedback on this as you can, even in terms of not just content, but tone and how you're coming across. You wanna hear as much as you can from other people to really get a good idea of how you're coming across in that writing. So again, like research experience, super important, include it and also make sure that you personalize it. It is very tempting when you're applying to maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten different programs to basically default to a form letter and just change different fields on it. But I hate to break it to you, we know. We can very easily read this and say, oh, you just changed the name of the, of the professor and the name of the university, and the rest of this is basically very vague. You want to tailor it, you want to personalize it, because just that little bit of extra effort is going to come across and it's going to help make a better impression overall. OK, I get it. This all seems like a lot, but I promise you that you are going to get to the other side of it. And then all you have to do is wait. But it turns out that waiting actually sucks ass and it can be the hardest part of the whole process. The truth is that it's not an exact science when you apply to PhD programs. In fact, you would probably be shocked when you find out how informal the decision process can actually be. There's no supercomputer crunching numbers to decide who's the best applicant. There's a lot of stuff in there that you cannot control, intangible factors that are just things you could never predict. And you can put yourself in the best possible position and still not get accepted anywhere. So. What do you do if you don't get in? Well, it's important to remember that almost no one gets in on their first attempt. And as hard as that can be, do your best not to take it personally, seriously. Once you get to a short list of applicants, the difference between getting an interview and not could be whether or not the person stubbed their toe or was wearing uncomfortable shoes when they looked at your application. I'm very serious about that. I mean, remember what I said at the jump? You've got 200 people that are applying for two spots and they're all very qualified. And the, even the people looking over their applications know that every one of those 200 people would probably do a pretty good job. So there's a lot of fuzzy details that get worked in. Sometimes it's about vibes or things that you can't control or predict. And you just kind of have to accept that and not take it personally. Is what people talk about when they say you should cast a wide net? Ideally, if you apply to a lot of programs, especially programs that you probably would fit very well in, then all those factors should wash out overall and you should get in somewhere. But it doesn't necessarily work out that cleanly. But this is a uh, here's the happy ending. I know this is kind of a dour point here, but let's here let's go end on a, on a more positive note here. But I can guarantee one more thing here, just by the fact that you've watched this video. You are already going to do better at this than my first round of applications. And there's a stigma about this kind of no one likes talking about any of this. No one likes to talk about the third time they took the GRE. No one likes to talk about their rejections or anything like that. There's a lot in academia in particular, and I guess everywhere, really, where people want to be seen a particular way. And especially when it comes to this kind of stuff, like big brain egghead things, People want to be seen as very smart and they don't want to see other people struggle or they don't want other people to know about their struggles. That's why I don't want to see them struggle. But I try to go out of my way to share some embarrassing stories and details so that when they do happen to folks like you, you know you're not alone with it. 
So let me let me share you or let me tell you a little bit of a story time. So this is the first time that I applied to grad school. Remember when I said no one told me any of the stuff in this video? So I didn't know anything, really. I thought that this was just like school plus, like new game plus for undergrad. I didn't even know that I should be applying to be a research assistant until my fourth year of undergrad. I was just really good at school and I really liked school. So I figured that I should apply to all the top programs. So I looked up what are the top 10 programs in social psychology and I applied to all of them. But here's the thing. I didn't even stop to email the professors that I was applying to work with at the time because no one told me what grad school was like. And so I ended up spending the money to apply to people that weren't even taking students that year. And I would have known if I had sent them a 30 second email. Even worse, I got some emails back from people that were taking students and they said, I don't know why you applied to me. They were nicer than that, but I don't know why you applied to me. I don't do that research anymore. Can you imagine how bad I, that feels? Think like, wow, I spent at that point, let's see, I think I applied to 10 programs. I had probably spent the better part of a thousand dollars to apply to people, some of which I had zero chance from the jump to ever be accepted as a student at. And not only that, most of my letter writers were instructors and I had only just recently started in research. So even the person that should have been the strongest letter writer didn't have anything really to say about me. And can you, can you absolutely, can you believe that I didn't get in anywhere? All in all, it took me about three years of applying before I was offered a position. I finished undergrad, I graduated, I had to take the GRE multiple times, I moved back in with my parents, and I sent emails to every researcher in the city, and I said, please let me work for you for free with as, for as much time as I possibly can. So I did the work. I volunteered in labs. I worked as much as I could. Almost none of it was compensated or paid, but that turned into stronger letters. I did better on the GRE the second time. When I applied on the second round, I got an interview, but I bombed that interview. And then on the third time, which was really the last time my parents were telling me like, you need to get a job and leave. And this is like the last time we're going to let you stay here and do this. I finally got two interviews that turned into two offers and that worked out for me. There are many very near timelines where I did not get into graduate school, even though after I did, I excelled at everything I touched. It's just a crapshoot and people don't like talking about their setbacks, but I think it's important to not only reflect on them, but to talk about them so that when they happen to other people, they know they're not alone with them. So, you know, it's kind of a fun thing to talk about. Ah, but on the plus side, in addition to all the work and the experience and the skills that I developed during that time, it also helped me hammer out what I wanted to do in graduate school and to decide that getting a PhD was actually the right choice for me because it's not the right choice for a lot of people. And I think that's an important thing to consider here. But that's what I've got for now. We're going to follow up on that idea of what is it like to actually be a graduate student and what is what is that experience? We're going to do that in a part two video. But for now, if you have any questions or anything like that about whether it's this kind of stuff or maybe perspective questions about graduate life, a.k.a. graduate strife, just let me know in the comments. And until then, be nice to yourself. Take care. <laughs>